Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Uh, tonight's session uh, is kind of a filler session, and I, I quickly, uh, mid afternoon, said, "Well, let's do something on processing techniques," um, because I didn't get a lot of commentary on uh, the hot products at Neef. But then we had a discussion before the session and uh, came up with a few things that are probably worth covering. Uh, before I jump into that, though, I do want to show off our image of the week, which. Uh, is right here. Uh, this week's image of the week, Caldwell 38, The Needle Galaxy by Chad Andrist. Uh, beautiful image. And uh, if you get a chance to go onto our website and check this out in full size, uh, you can really see some of the detail he pulled out of this. Um, it's more about uh, sharpening that structure on the inside, which kind of got me thinking about processing techniques and how you do things like that, uh, which is why I came up with today's topic. But uh, like I said, uh, interesting conversations about stuff at Neep. So let me, uh, let me steal my screen back, see if I pop up here. Yes. Um, so... Uh, Last week, uh, basically the only hot product that we had come up with uh, from Neef was the Celestron Raza 14, the 14-inch uh, um, uh, astrograph, uh, very fast. Uh, but uh, more interestingly was the new focus system, which uh, we've all been, uh, I think all of us SCT users were, were looking at that like, ooh, what, what is that? Uh, but that was last week. Uh, another thing that was pointed out that is, I guess Borg has a new line of refractors coming out, um, and we don't know much about them. Uh, all I know was they were there, they were showing them off, and uh, apparently they were interesting enough that uh, they, they generated some buzz. Um, we, this is where the, the discussion got interesting. Uh, we were discussing before the, the show... Um, uh, interesting new products at Neef, and someone mentioned a camera vendor that came out with a new version of a camera that's housing the 8300 sensor. Uh, and of course, uh, the comment was, uh, I don't know, it's an old sensor. Uh, you, you might be putting your uh, eggs in the wrong, or I'm sorry, you might be putting your uh, eggs in the wrong basket or whatever that uh, cliche would be. But um, that said, uh, I'm going to open this discussion up to the people in the room here because uh, they were the ones that were making the interesting comments. What do you guys think? Um, why is the 8300 sensor becoming dated? Uh, is it that it's old? Is it that uh, the 16200 came out? Uh, it's bigger, bigger pixels, kind of better overall. Is it the CMOS sensors or is there other stuff going on? Uh, anyone in the room that happens to have their mic uh, unmuted or anything like that, uh, please jump in. Well, I think that there is nothing wrong with the 8300 system. I think it's, it's a great, great thing. But I think the CMOS, the Panasonic, with the same exact size for micro four thirds, being one third of the price. You know, the camera being $1,000, uh, same size sensor, I think that's, the, you know, it's killing its sales. Uh, but I think there is, you know, there's nothing wrong with the 8300 sensor. It's a perfectly capable sensor. I don't know if I would tell somebody to go buy a brand new camera with an 8300 sensor right now. Um, but, you know, if you, there are good deals out there. Like I was talking to the, Astral Instruments guy, where he has a uh, 8300 version with a built-in computer that runs your mount and runs your camera, auto guides, all together with filter wheel with filters for less than twenty-five hundred dollars. I don't know. At that point, now the tables might turn. Right. I mean, that's the way I'm thinking. Is uh... Most of us paid double to triple that for our cameras. And at 2,500, that includes the computer. So you're also eliminating some potential issues. Uh, 
a lot of us have had, uh, I don't want to say issues with possible interference or things that uh, might have been coming from the USB cable or um, a hub or something like that. Uh, so having the built-in computer, there's a lot more integrated of a package, which usually means uh, less issues. Um, I mean, I, I don't know the exact details of the computer in that one, Adam, but again, it also kind of locks you into that platform too, uh, if there is an issue with it or if it doesn't play nicely with something else that you've got. Not to say it's a bad approach. I, I just was a little worried about that. Right, like for example, uh, maybe it has a proprietary acquisition program, so you wouldn't be able to integrate it with uh, uh, SGP or whatever program you're using. Um, that's actually something I don't I'm know that much, that many details about it. My, my, my interest was the price, you know, you, you're looking at a complete, like, even if you deduct the computer out of it at $2,500 with filters, that means that's a plug ready, ready to go plug and play system Yeah, for $2,500. Now you might be back in the contention. Not particular. I'm not talking about that particular manufacturer, but at that price point, with a camera with an 8300 sensor, that all of a sudden might be worth looking into. I don't. I don't know, mm -hmm. because I'm. To be honest with you, I'm still not impressed with the CMOS. I mean, uh, well, th that's what we should really talk about. What do you, What do you guys? Ken, you you recently got a CMOS camera. Tell us. Well, I'm still working with it a little bit. I don't have as much experience with it as I do with my QSI. Um, actually, I'll, I'll have to bring up some pictures in a minute and see if I can get them up. But so far, I'm I'm impressed with it. You know, we had a long thread on Cloudy Nights today about calibrating them. And it seems like, um, you know, there's still some questions about what are the best ways to calibrate them. In particular, if they've got glows, they don't really like bias frames, uh, which throws a lot of folks off. Some of the, the confusion I think that you see on forums with the, the ZWO cameras is just that kind of there's this um, mythology that these are just so radically different that standard trade craft out there for processing images just doesn't apply to them. Uh, the other thing might be that a lot of folks are having the same sort of problems with them that they would have had with SBIGs or QSIs or SXs in the past. It's just that, that the CMOS cameras happen to be the cameras that most beginners choose because of the price. So mm -hmm. I, I think we're getting kind of a, maybe not a, a, we've got kind of a bias in that regard that newer users are tending to go with those cameras. Um, and that's not a slam against the most users. Problem. We just sort of spread the joy of new userdom out across a, a wider range of cameras. Let me see if I can get those uh, images I was going to share with you up. Hang on. That's actually a great point. Is uh, they're selling uh, an entry level priced camera with slightly more advanced features uh, to a lot of beginners, and it's being recommended to a lot of beginners and a lot of people who don't have experience. And then when they have the same issues that basically all beginners have, we go and blame the camera, right? Uh, we've all had those issues. We've all had that, uh, you know, my flats aren't working or uh, uh, I've got walking noise or, or whatever it may be. Um, and there was always something in our technique that we were able to identify and eliminate, uh, not just blame the gear. Um, yeah. And, but then again, and I'm still personally, I'm still not used to that, uh, you know, multiple short exposures technique is, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, this, can you, you got some images? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I, 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 am I, I up? Yes, I, you're up, Ken. Okay, so I've got these two images here. Now, they're not to scale because they're they're proportioned a little differently. Uh, but the one on the left is out of my ASI 183, and that represents about 99 minutes of luminance out of a 70-millimeter refractor. So this is not Apple's 
to Apple's comparison. The one on the right is the QSI 690. It's about 100 minutes and it's out of my SVQ 100. And they're both out of my, uh, you know, light polluted backyard. And I just put these together for some comparison. So right off the bat, you can see that there's a big difference. Part of it is, you know, in terms of its, its uh, FOV, that's mostly because of the optical tube. If you actually lay the two cameras on top of each other, the ZWO has smaller pixels, but it's got a lot more of them. And so they're actually shaped differently, but, but they're kind of the same. In this case, you're seeing more of an FOV. I had to crop uh, the ASI picture on the left a little more because I, I had some goofy images I was trying to integrate. And so I, I kind of had some weird dither lines. But if you kind of zoom in here and you look at these two, now, my, I barely processed these at all. I think I did an ABE on them to knock out some gradients. But it's about the same time. The one on the left, again, comes from a noticeably smaller telescope. Uh, and was done on a different mount. So, again, not the same. But, you know, so far I like the ASI. It may be a little finickier to work with in some cases. But um, the performance from it, I really can't knock. Uh-huh. So what do, you, what do you mean by finicky to work with? Well, again, if people are saying things about, you know, their calibration issues, that's, you know, that's one thing. And another thing with the QSI was that really you didn't have much to play with. You couldn't go in, you couldn't mess with, you know, you had a high gain and a low gain, but I don't think very many people ever worked with that. Whereas with the ZWO, you've got a number that you can mess with. Plus you've got a number for the, for the offset that you can mess with. So, so there's more for people to dig their fingers in and, and get involved with. In terms of pickiness with the camera, I can't say anything bad about the hardware. You know, when you assemble, well, I could. When you assemble it, it's a little, it's a little messy. If you're used to, you know, a, an expensive uh, QSI that's got the integrated guide port and the integrated filter wheel, you just pull it out of the box and you slap it on the camera and you're done. But when it comes to the ZWO, you've got to assemble it. You've got to shim it if you want things to be orthogonal. Um, the drivers, at least for you, for Sky X, were a little rough early on. They didn't include um, some of the fits keywords that you wanted. But now they're they're really quite solid. I'm afraid that doesn't necessarily answer your question, Tolga. No, 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 no. I mean that's that's all part of it you know just when i when i uh, beta tested the one of the first uh, cmos cameras right i remember that, was, that yeah that, that was one of my major complaints was that you know i went from a so i went from a qsi to this camera and uh you know it was like growing pains you know it's just like it, just like you said you right went from a premium uh all work together camera to this and then you you're fighting with it all night yeah and then now but I, then somebody who came from a dslr went up to this we can't bought this camera to them they went up right so that's the thing I'm, I'm not sure that the camera really can i can pick on the camera so much as i could just say that i'm spoiled by something else that's that's exactly my point yeah just like and, you know, so you i can't i can't bad mouth the camera i mean when people ask me my opinions i like it it's a nice little camera it's not, you know, quite the same experience as a QSI or my, my old school S big was, but, um, but yeah, I mean, the only thing, the only weak spot in my opinion in the ZO, ZWO line that I've got, which is the guider and the imager and the filter wheel and the off axis guiders, the off axis guiders chintzy, you know, it involves kind of screwing around with it and tightening things very precisely in a very specific order and shimming stuff with paper and shimming things with tape. That's the weak spot in the system. Otherwise, the rest again, of it, I can't complain about. But then again, you're talking about, what, $130? Yes, it's a $120 piece of equipment. You're yeah, absolutely so, right. Uh, you know, you, you could... You, you don't have to go with a ZW off axis guider, right? We could go spend a little bit more Right. No, absolutely. Um, and that also comes into play with that off-axis guider. I kind of, we're going off topic a little bit here, but that off-axis guider has a small prism. 
and it marries up perfectly with the ASI 290 size camera. But it, if you put something bigger, like a 170, an IMX 174 camera or a Lodestar or something, you're going to get some pretty big light fall off because the prism's just small. Now, after saying all this, I'm probably going to get crucified on cloudy nights as a snob, but so be it. <laughs> uh, talking about cloudy nights, Adam, uh, have you guys read uh, John Hayes's uh, uh, post about the RASA 14? And the focusing system that he designed for Celestron. No, I hadn't read that, but I heard I heard it as a rumor that he was helping them with that. So uh, well, it, well, he's been working uh, with Celestron for you know for the last year, but now finally he was given clearance to basically before he couldn't talk about it. Now he, he they told him it's okay, go ahead, you could you know say. Uh, Bring it up and uh, please, please tell me they're going to call it the harassa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, so there is no image shift, there is no backlash. Uh, and you know, if you guys know John, mm -hmm. you know, he's yeah. meticulous. You know, he's yeah, yeah. He designed something, it's going to work. Yeah. But that here's the bad, you ready for the bad news? Go ahead. They're not putting on the regular C14. Oh, no? No. My thought was it might be too expensive. Right. But. But, you know, how much more expensive is it going to be? Like, what do you do? What do you normally do? Like, you can buy that and put an Atlas in the back of it. Okay, now you have a rock solid focuser. That's $2,500. It's not, it'll be less than that. I'm sure it'll be less than that. Yeah, it's <clears throat> because it's such a long focal length system, though, if what you're trying to do is have no shift while you're focusing, then that's difficult and expensive to accomplish. If you're just trying to have no shift while you're imaging, then the mirror locks work fine, right? But I think if you're trying to hit the next level where you can do active focusing while like in in the middle of an image, or if you're a planetary guy and you just don't want any focus shift or no way, no how, but. So John Hayes' C14, it's a regular C14. Mm -hmm. does, it does have this new RASA 14 focusing system on it because that was his and he used that as a testing bed on it. And uh, he uses the mirror and he, he uses focus locks, focus lock. What that means is that he's actively focused, live focusing during the image. For that to happen, there has to be zero image shift. Right. Because think about it, you're moving the mirror as you're imaging. You're not oh, I, focus yeah. run in between exposures. Yeah, and I understand that. It's hard to accomplish with a moving mirror. Correct. So if, if we could do that, that means there is no image shift. Yeah. Yeah. Very. I. I'm gonna have to read that post because I'm very interested in how they pulled that off. Uh. I, yeah. I'm, my only thing is that I wish they, you know, they could call it a, a C14 Pro. They could call it a C14 Plus. You know, I think, you know, people would be interested. I mean, I think just. Uh, the, the, the C8, right? The best seller of all of them. Put it on the C8 and uh, sell it as an imaging. But like a, basically what the Edge HD was, but fix that one limitation and then all of a sudden you've got it. But, um, you know, these are things we're, we're dreaming about. The, the C8's pretty good when it comes to imaging. It is what it is. It's a little bit slower, but mm -hmm. for uh, the reach that it gives, uh, it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, the more you scrutinize it, the, I, I think the one thing that you really look to is the focusing. Um, and for long focal length planetary, uh, that could be a little bit of, a, uh, an issue, uh, if you're focusing back and forth and the, the planet's moving out of the field. Um, yeah, if you have a small chip, you can move the planet out of your field of view. Exactly, exactly. 
if uh, you know most of those guys do what do you call that region of interest or something you they crop there's already small sensors and you focus and you're done you, yep anyhow that was that was pretty uh and i i personally i went up to the rasa 14 and i didn't even look at anything i just put my hand on the focus knob mm -hmm. and i'm feeling you know i'm turning it left and right and i'm feeling to see when the i i could feel the i'm trying to feel the backlash you know let me see like right, right. In my heel, your engagement and i didn't feel anything it's just it, as soon as you touch it you feel the mirror move hmm. which was uh but the price of it is is a little it was a uh, little shocking twelve thousand it was twelve nine or something like yeah. that 30 12 995 yeah it, that was a little sticker shock yeah but it's a 14 inch f 2.2 right so well but here's here's the way i looked at it you know like a c14 hh c11 hhd and rasa 11 they're not that far apart in price mm -hmm. so uh that i went with that you know comparison and then Look at the, the price difference between a C14 HHD versus C14 Rasa. It's more than double. Mm -hmm. So I, that that was the sticker shock a little bit. I'll bet it's all. Well, I shouldn't say all, but I'll bet a lot of it's in that focus system. I probably. I mean that's that's the problem. Is uh, it's not that they couldn't do it. It's could they do it and keep the price uh -huh. at all reasonable? Another thing is the. Uh, the built-in correct, not the front corrector, but the RAS, I guess, to make it easier to understand, I'm going to call it the Hyperstar corrector, the built-in Hyperstar corrector in the RASA. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. The small corrector, not the large SCT corrector. Yes. The size of that is like a five-inch refractor. Huh. So I'm sure that cost a couple of bucks. Yeah. Yeah, that that that's a significant portion too. I mean, us basically, uh, you're putting Hyperstar onto uh, the C14, but uh, it's corrected for a 70, uh, uh, well, 70 yeah, millimeter. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, it's it's basically a pro system. Uh, mm -hmm. It does what the premium systems do. Yeah, I, you know, I've been working with these uh, uh, Riccardi Honda telescopes at f3, f3.8, and, uh, you know, similar focal lengths, mm -hmm. 300 millimeter, 200 to 300 millimeter aperture. And, oh, and Eric is too. He, he could talk about them too. And they're, they're crazy. They're, they're incredible light buckets. Uh, and I, so this would be, I guess, similar to something like that. So, mm -hmm. so if you... If you look at it, don't look at it like a Celestron. If you can get that uh, out of your head, just don't look at it like a Celestron, but compare what you're getting for the money. You know, uh, Riccardi, um, Astrophysics Riccardi Honda's 305 costs $25,000. <laughs> and this is a similar telescope that's faster. Yep. You know, I got I got to ask what you could possibly mean by don't look at it as a celestron. <laughs> as a um, don't don't look premium, at it as a mass produced type of non premium that, brand like an astrophysics yeah. or uh, Officina Stellare. Yeah, I, I think we have to understand that with our audience that that um, there's there's a lot of non premium brands out there, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they. They work very, very, very well for most people most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all seen Richard, right? We love the man. And we've seen his uh, slide where with the 80-20 rule and the asymptotic expenditures and versus quality. And, uh, you know, you can spend after a certain point, you can keep spending, but you're not going to be getting all that much more. You know, so uh -huh. keep that in mind, folks. Well, yeah, I, well, I didn't want to. You might actually get some argument about that. Pardon? Uh, what you get. I think if you pair uh, the more expensive telescopes with good scene conditions, then you do get more. Yeah, 
Right. Um, I'm not saying, oh no, I'm saying that what you get per dollar of expenditure decreases. Your first four or $5,000 you put into your astro imaging rig is going to get you more probably than your next 5,000. Yeah, right. It's not a linear function for sure. And, and again, it depends a lot on your same conditions. And when you're starting out, of course, every image, and I remember that well, works wonderful for you. And until you get to the point where you want better and better and better, and you realize that you need both a better telescope and better scene conditions, and perhaps a lot more processing expertise, that's where it comes into value. But it's not a linear function for sure. No, it's, a, it's an exponential cycle of doom. It's... It's the happy uh, days are here. Hey, Adam, don't forget to look at the uh, comments going on. I know. I see. I'm just. Uh, I'm seeing a couple there. Uh, um, am I being? Am I being killed? No, no, no. I'm. I'm just. Um, remember, we have people calling in and asking. When talk radio here, you got to answer the the call. You know, before man. we bless the Celestron as being the next AP Ricardi Honda's, we have to see how it performs. Right. Right. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, I'm sorry, we do have a comment that uh, I do want to address. Uh, El Miko, I currently process my picks with Nebulosity 4. Am I not getting full pot full potential out of my images? And um, I, uh, first I'll qualify this by saying I don't use Nebulosity. Uh, I use PixInsight and Photoshop. But I don't think it's any one program or anything like that that's gonna limit the potential of your images. Most of the processing programs all have different ways of getting to the same result. Um, the only thing that I think would be limiting your potential would possibly be any information you can get. Um, but basically you can keep seeking out the knowledge and trying to learn as much as you possibly can. Uh, so I wouldn't blame uh, any one program for not getting the full potential out of your images. Um, that said, uh, there are certain things about PixInsight that I really like when it, uh, specifically the, the uh, calibration routine. Um, the, um, uh, there are certain things out of, in Photoshop that I really like, which is basically layering and the, the, the way to visualize stuff on the fly. Uh, but but no, I'm not going to say uh, Nebulosity 4 is limiting your the potential of your images. Um, I used to use Nebulosity for my pre-processing, and it was very good. The only thing I didn't like it, well, not that I didn't like about it, it's just that there's a slow part of it where the star um, alignment procedure is kind of manual. You have to, I mean, I, okay, and this is two years ago. It may have changed, so let me put a disclaimer on that. Uh, the way it was done at the time I was using it is that you have to go pick the star. Like you have to tell it this star is this star in the next image. It's this star. It's this. You have to identify the same stars in each image. Uh, you know, so if you had 50 subs, you have to go to each one and say, okay, this star is that star in this image. So if you had, and then if you had a meridian flip, that star would flip onto the other side and you have to tell it, okay, this star is that star. So it was pretty labor intensive, but besides that, if you have the time, it does a very good job. Al Miko, I'm going to add to what has already been contributed here, and both of those are important points, both Adams and Tolgos. Um, the real way, the question you're asking is, um, are you getting the full potential out of your images? Um, you may be getting the full potential of what you can get at this stage of your processing experience, or maybe not. Um, and rather than go off looking for new, um, I, the, the, question, the question underneath the question you're asking is, should I go to some other program because it's more powerful? Well, yeah, there are more powerful programs that do things faster or have more things that can be done and stuff like that. But are you ready for them yet? Uh, have you got a? Have you got all the other things organized in your uh, image uh, data acquisition? 
uh, are you already getting the good shots and you're not the trailering and all that other stuff? Um, your, your, your dithering is good. Uh, you, you know how to keep your files straight and all that stuff. But hey, uh, 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 Craig Stark software is really good at leading you through all that stuff. And are you using everything that is already in Nebulosity? If you're using it all and you're seeing that it's not doing some stuff you want to do, then the question becomes, what other pieces, what other tools do I need out there someplace to improve it further on? Um, so it's not, it's not whether it's getting all the out of your out of your image. It's whether you personally are pulling all of it out, counting the fact that you're using nebulosity and that particular imaging rig and those particular seeing conditions in your skies and all those other things. If you found that you've maxed everything out then maybe it's time to look for a more powerful piece of software. You know, it's um, one of the ways that I like to think about it is, <clears throat> and we've kind of danced around this point, which is why I'm bringing it up. Um, usually, uh, if you ask, if you have to ask that question, uh, am I getting the most out of my images? Um, or am I not getting the most out of my images? You kind of suspect that you aren't getting the most out of your images, but you're not quite sure exactly what it is. And I think as you do gain more experience, you start to be able to identify those things that are limiting you. And it's best not to change too much until you identify your limitations. Um, a good way to find out about your own limitations is, and I've done this before, and I'm, I'm sure some other people, uh, put your data, go to one of, you know, Cloud and Ice, and go to the imaging forum and make your data available to some of the other guys and say, hey, what can you guys do with this and see what they do with it. Yep. And if they're getting similar results as you, that means, you know, it means something. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, you reach out to the community and uh, there's a lot of people that are willing to process data just to basically have something to process. Um, and uh, you know what? Everyone's image is going to look different, but you're going to see one person's image that you really like and you're going you're gonna to ask them how they did it and uh, you'll probably learn something or, or you'll know more about what it is you're trying to get out of your image. Um, it may not be the program. It may just be their eye or what their vision for what they wanted the image to look like. Um, on the, okay, I'm reading Edmund's uh, question here. On the topic of processing, he tried using the synthetic flat from one of Josh's tutorials. One thing he accidentally bumped into is using it on the on high dynamic range picture like M42. Without masking M42, the resulting synthetic flat shows some kind of pattern that mimics local histogram processing. The resulting flat can be used as a mask and do whatever you want. I mean, I'd have to go back to that um, tutorial to check it out. But what I think you're saying is um, by using the synthetic flat, you are able to create a mask that was more useful for, uh, let me think, uh, possibly, uh, I don't know if it's for keeping the, the range not so, uh, to keep it from blowing out or uh, whether it was able to ha let you add detail or something. I'm not quite sure, but I'd have to go back and check that out. If anyone reads that question differently than I am, please. Uh, Edmund, are you, um, you're making your own flat. You're not there's no way you could have borrowed Josh's flat itself, right? Because I mean, your flat must be specific to your camera. Uh, I think it may be, maybe the word where, where you say you're using the synthetic flat from one of Josh's tutorial, you probably, you mean you're using the process of the synthetic flat, right? Um, and then, um, and then he's using the image that he got as a map. Yeah. 
to do yeah. what he says or do whatever you want with it but I, I don't know what you would use a flat mask the process yeah i want to go back and see exactly how he made that synthetic flat. It, it does it does it sound kind of like um um oh what's it called the high um high pass filter over in um um photoshop I just I don't remember his method for making the the yeah. synthetic flat, and I don't remember his reason. Have to get Josh back. He hasn't been around. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Um. So we've caught up on questions. If you guys have any other questions, please uh, type them in. Um. Josh, uh, last time I spoke to him, he had been in uh, Taiwan, I believe, back and forth uh, for work. Um, I will reach out to him again and uh, see what he's been up to, though. Uh, but sometimes life gets in the way of uh, the hobbies, unfortunately. Um, I, um, on another note, I heard from um, Warren Keller. I asked him how the registration's going at, uh, for the event this weekend, and uh, they're, they're, it's going pretty good from what he said. So um, I just wanted to remind everybody that if you're, if you're, maybe I don't even know if registration is still open over there, but there, that big event's going on this weekend for um, Learning Picks Insight with Warren Keller and uh, those guys. So. I talked to the manager. Pardon? He, he was one of the speakers at NEF. Yeah. His talk was great. Uh, so th this workshop coming up is a lot more, you know, in depth. This multiple days, I believe, is four or five. To uh, I don't know about four or five, but yeah, at least, three, at least three days, right? You know what we should do? We should go over to billions and billions and see if he can right. even still it's register for it. So. Uh, I'll, I'll go over there while we're talking. There was four places left. The class is limited to 30 people, and there was four places left as of last weekend. So I don't know where he's at now. Uh, but uh, I talked to him. He was there with his wife. Uh, Ron Brecher was there. He's also going to be at the Buffalo workshop. So that's a really intense workshop. Alex, are you pulling the information? Where uh, I forget. I'm like, I'm like me. It's um, your problem. Um, I, I was trying to, but I, it's it's not obvious on billions and billions. It might be on this other one. Oh, what's the other one called? Um, oh, I've got too many screens open. Uh, IP for AP, right? There it is. Let's see. Clip, 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 clip. Talk among yourselves, kids. It's May 4th to 6th. Yeah, I got it. May 4th to 6th. I'm trying to I'm trying to see the registration page. I can't seem to click into it. It may be too late to click in. I don't know. I should have asked when I was visiting with them. Well, I, I have it. Uh, do you want me to send you the link or? Oh, no, just open it up. Just just, uh, just share your screen. Yeah. And have it OK. That's what all I was going to do. I just can't seem to get into it. Buffalo, we think Buffalo, New York, or around Buffalo, New York. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there's another question, how much the works the workshop costs to attend? Here, here you go. Can you guys? Oh, here we go. Got it. Three days, $595. Uh, that includes lunch and re refreshments, two instructors. Uh, it's Toga, would you scan up? I don't think it's technically Buffalo. I think it's outside of Buffalo. Oh, it is University of Buffalo. There you go. Um, Here's the map. Yeah, it's on IP for AP website, IP for AP.com. Yeah, I mean, I hope you guys could see the, yes. the web page up top here. 
Can can you get to the registration or so? Can you still register for it? We don't want to give uh, out bad information to all right our now button. Follower. I'm clicking on the button. Oh, there it is down there. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, Edmund posted the picture. Um. So let me see. Uh, let me unshare my screen. Yeah, let's get out of there, Tolga. <laughs> We do another topic, or are we finished with? Well, one? no, I'm I'm looking at Edwin's picture, and I'm trying to think oh. about the application of it. I don't know if you guys are seeing it. Uh, he posted it over in comments. Um, you know, all we've got is the logo, as far as I can tell, on the screen here. Um, okay, let me pull it up on my screen somehow. I'm curious what you would use this for. I see the picture. Yeah, that, that's what I'm oh, wondering myself. Okay. Um, the, um, so this image right here, I guess, is, uh, I'm trying to think now what it is, a synthetic flat, but. You know, I don't think, it, did he call it a synthetic flat, Edmund? I think it was just making masks out of um, your um, your luminances, or yeah, your, your, well, your images. See, if, if you remove the stars from this, I could see you using it for like a detail mask where you're trying to bring more structure into this. But I mean, there'd be certain things I could use this as a mask for. I, I'm not 100% sure. I, I, I'm not sure I would need a synthetic flat to get a mask out of a regular image that would give me the same benefits though. But but again, I'm I'm not remembering exactly what Josh was using this for. Uh -huh. He might have had a really specific reason for creating a mask like that. Okay. Uh, I've got a question for some of you processing gurus. I've got a um, I've got a bad column in um, one of the. Um, yeah, and I've got a bad column. And what happens to a bad column when you're using cosmetic correction and the batch processor when you've got two different binning levels? I don't use cosmetic correction. Well, I'll the question again. What do you mean when you have two different binning levels? Okay. Um, let's say that I've got a bad column and 1,000. Okay. okay. My, my column 1,000 is bad on... So it's obviously bad on the chip. Okay. Now, um, when I'm binned one to one, I tell cosmetic correction to go over and correct a column 1000 and it does a wonderful job and it disappears. Uh -huh. Okay. When I'm binned two by two, well, that bad column is now over column 500. Uh -huh. Well, do you so, have an image? Have you developed your cosmetic correction image for the bin two? You know, you get a lot of back background. Please, please repeat that, Eric. I'm, I'm you need to develop an image to do your cosmetic correction. I assume you have to do it for bin one and bin two. I don't use cosmetic correction anymore. Your column should process out with uh, with bias and dark. So Yeah, I know it should. Sometimes they don't. Pardon? Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes process. they don't. Yeah. Column. This this one this one does. Or, or they process out and they turn into a black column instead of a white column. Right. So yeah. if you're doing cosmetic correction, you have to have an image to correct from, which means right. you're going to have to make one for a bin two as well as bin one. Okay, so that means that I can't use I can't put all of my subs into the same batch processing. I have to batch process for luminance and then or batch process for bin level one, and then batch process for bin level two. While you're talking two different things, uh, your cosmetic correction, you can run that as a separate process. It, the cosmetic correction goes where? You can run that as a separate process if you have any issues. Yeah, but he, he's using batch processing, so. But, I'm at, but my question is, uh, am, yeah. I, am I stuck 
for the rest of my life not using batch processing to process my whole batch of subs? And I think the answer is going to be, yeah, well, you're going to have to bat. I'm going to have not to. That, not that you're stuck out of it. It's just that you're going to set, you're going to have to separate your bins and batch process your bins separately. You know, we're all kind of spoiled with this batch processing, but if you go right from the beginning, they say don't use it as your final processing, especially if you have issues like your cosmetic correction. So that's what I thought. That's where I thought I'm going to go. Yeah, you're going to have to create a bad bad pixel, you know, whatever you call it, the pixel. Bad yeah. pixel I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to have two different bad pixel maps, and since cosmetic correction only has one bad pixel map, I'm going to have to process twice yeah. mm -hmm. well no you can just you can just do your cosmetic correction as a separate process <laughs> eric yeah but you you keep saying that, that that's true and if, if i did everything separately great i'm talking about and using batch processing and you're saying well stop using batch processing group ball okay i got it yeah uh, I, well, I, I, yeah I'm, I'm not saying that because i use it all the time um, well but, stop using it for the final you know what's Remember, with batch processing, it's also doing it, your correction, your calibrations in the beginning. And you can take those files and you can work on them separately and still take advantage of some of the batch processing functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, Alex, I have an idea. So, I, haven't, I haven't tried this, uh, but you could try it. Why not put both of them in there? Um, two put, different bad column maps. Why not put the 500 and 1000 in there in the cosmetic, in the back pixel map in the same cosmetic correction and let it do all. Do you yeah. follow me? Well, I, you know what? I certainly should try because that's only another, you know, five minute operation to put it in and, you know, go get a, go get a cup of tea while it's doing it. And then I come back and see which one works. The only downfall is going to be obviously on, on the, Obviously, on the one by one, it's going to correct the 500th line, even though there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. I, yeah. But and, give it a try. Yeah. It's worth a try. I mean, I got it to work. I mean, eventually, I got everything all prettified up so you can't see it and stuff like that. It's just I'm inherently lazy. So. <laughs> All right. Um, any other topics you guys would like to talk about? If not, then uh, I, I got I got one. Go ahead. <coughs> who's who's gonna who's gonna come out to Texas? I, I I hope to see you all at Texas and be sure to come on up and say hi. I did pack my microphone and I've got my my telephone with me, which means that I'll be able to. Maybe have the imaging rigs of Texas if, Ooh, it, very nice. you know, that might be interesting someday. But is that this weekend? Yeah, it starts. Uh, I'm leaving Sunday morning. Everybody else is leaving. Like, you know, they'll be there Sunday morning. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And then it goes a week and um, it ends a week from Sunday, week or two weeks from today. So it's next Sunday to the Sunday after that. How's the weather look? You're really nasty, aren't you, Toga? Yes, I am. You know what the weather looks like, and you no, know. No, I don't. I so I don't. I did not. I did okay. Not. I I posted a few days back. It says, "Hey, it's ten days out, but the weather looks poopy." And then, and then somebody today, "Hey, it still looks poopy, and now it's only seven days out or five days out or whatever." It's got twenty percent chance of rain for the first three or four days that are, that are forecast, and uh, half clouds. So I'm gonna but, be there for the full party, I'm sure you'll have a couple, a few nice days. Yeah, yeah. After driving thirty six hundred miles or whatever it is, but yeah, it'll be nice. It'll be a nice day. It'll be a nice party, and I'll see everybody there. Who who said it's going? George will be going. George, I will probably be on all three fields. Um, I will be. Um, I, I want to go up to the upper field. There's some really southern objects. Remember my Caldwells? I don't know if you've ever heard about my Caldwells. But I figure I can get about five or six Caldwells if I can see down to about three or four degrees off the horizon. 
And uh, by the way, I'm a visual observer more than astronomy or more than astrophotography. So I've got them and I want to complete the, um, the observers challenge. They've got about 30 planetaries we can find. So um, I, I'll, get, I'll get those. But anybody else, be sure to come up and say, hey, and um, I'll come over and visit with you. Okay. I'll tell you, this time of year is tough to find targets. Uh, yeah, particularly in the backyard where, you know, you can't use narrowband um, now because there aren't any narrowband objects up there, really. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm finished. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, next week, uh, something will get scheduled, and uh, I will try and post it as soon as I possibly can. Uh, hopefully we'll get some stuff on Texas Star Party and you guys will have a good time there. Um, otherwise, thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Good night, guys. Okay, bye-bye.